at the core of Design 39 campus is the future is the place we create. Been doing some work with the D School. They're out of Stanford, so the Stanford D School. Uh, we've been doing some scenario planning, and I'm on the, also the design team with the district. There's a small team of us that are putting together um, different ideas on how we can move forward. So a lot of just empathy seeking right now, um, and we'll be building out. They're just pitched out a variety of surveys to staff. Parents will be coming shortly. Uh, there'll be surveys going out to students. Um, but specifically, I want to just talk about our own space and what can we do and what we've been thinking about as well. So really, it's about designing this future. So I want to go through a few slides. <clears throat> These are things that are coming out. Uh, CDC, we see a variety of different ways of when people are ready to be open and, and systems. We see that San Diego is moving through that phasing. Um, so these are come a few of the critical questions that we need to be able to answer about reopening. Do we have, you know, um, the ability to screen students? Is the school ready to accommodate children and employees with higher risk or serious illnesses? Uh, are we following the, the guidelines and face mask coverings and things like that? Disinfectants. So being able to navigate that is going to be a critical component to bringing back school and what does school actually look like? So we'll talk through some of that. Uh, there's great questions that will help to facilitate us for that. Um, the other piece here is just relaunching school. Uh, this is the CDC uh, deci decision tree. Um, I'll put a link in the chat box as well. It just talks about, you kind of have to be able to answer these questions as, according to the CDC to be able to open, and I'll, I'll show you that. This is just one of the columns there about being able to reopen, so I'll share that as well. Um, so just being really thoughtful for the health and safety of our kids, and also critically that we don't want to have a regression of learning either. Um, so how do we make that happen? So a lot of empathy syncing, uh, listening to our students, we'll be doing a lot of that, uh, a lot of work with our staff. So we'll talk about timing as well. When do we kind of close out distance learning for this year so that we can give staff the time to really unpack and kind of think about what ne next year is going to look like uh, so that it can be even more robust and learn from the lessons that we had when we had to pivot on a dime this year. Um, just a lot around um, just communicating out early and often. So this is part of that first phase is just getting some feedback and feed forward from you so then we can move forward in a really uh, thoughtful um, and empathetic way. Um, some of the things that will be playing into this uh, decision making is really around COVID itself is that the shorter, milder kind of approach will come because of these conditions that are kind of in this in space. And I don't, as we all don't have a crystal ball to kind of know like how is that going in terms of testing becoming abundant and available, uh, antiviral treatments, vaccines fast, fast tracked, and the kind of that herd immunity. Uh, kind of getting back to normal-ish would need these kind of things to happen. Uh, longer intense kind of getting back to normal-ish. Um, we see an increase in these um, death rates, uh, strapped healthcare systems, unreliable testing, things like that. So I'm no expert in this space, but I want you to know that next week, we had a really great conversation with Dr. Butler. He's one of our parents here who's on the front lines of the COVID. As a doctor, he communicates with hundreds of doctors across the nation. So he'll be on next Thursday, and we'll speak specifically about this. He has kids at our school talking about how he even feels about that. So next Thursday, 7 o'clock, we'll have a conversation specifically about more the things that I want to get out of my out of lane here in terms of my expertise in this space. Um, but just this kind of looking at in terms of design, uh, that's what we're about. So when we start to design, we're looking at this kind of fast recovery um, into normal-ish with shorter durations, or is it gonna be more constrained? Uh, or is there gonna be ultimately collapse and like where school is just different completely? Uh, today there was information going out with the uh, UC systems, UC California. They're actually pulling away from SAT scores and um, ACT scores. So there's a lot of transformation that's going to happen like normally with just in this, this space. It might actually go the way of Blockbuster. Um, normal is kind of maybe not the way we would probably look at it. Normal-ish, what are those things looking like as we return to school? A lot of probably more constraints. I don't believe collapse will actually happen. Uh, but there'll definitely be some transformation coming uh, and some uh, constraints that we need to navigate through just as we learn no one has done this before really eh, maybe 1918 but uh, not in this current ecosystem uh, this is what we're about and um, we are designers so ultimately it's about people so let me uh, get out of this screen and i want to then flip to the padlet wall so what i did is I took the Padlet wall and I just want to talk through a few of the pieces 
uh, that really had some interest based off of your voting. You can see here um, in this first one in this blue, uh, what questions right here are on your mind um, uh, regarding reopening school in August. So I'm gonna just talk through these uh, in my best version yet, right? In terms of what I know and what we've been talking about and then see uh, if that sparks some other conversations for us to have. So probably about 20 minutes of this, and then we'll have about 30 minutes just to open it up. So uh, take notes or put in the chat box. I can't really see it right now because I'm just looking at my screen. So if he's patient, I'll go through about, uh, I'm gonna take the top four or five from each bucket uh, in terms, so I just reprioritize these. So I just pulled the, the one that had the most votes up to the top so we can at least make sure we get to each one of those. So. This first context is what questions are on your mind regarding reopening school in August? And that's kind of a biased question. You know, I, I put it on there. But does that assume we're going to be re reopening? You know, so just kind of get the conversation going. And I think that's the best part for us to, as a community to connect. Uh, so the first one here had 21 votes up and it said of interest, uh, will school classroom hours be shorter, alternate days, or will there be options to continue distance learning? By the way, I think D39 is doing a great job. Okay, I didn't pull that up to the top because that twin, but I do appreciate the positive energy. Uh, staff has been working uh, tremendously along with you all. Uh, you can't do this without parents and we can't do this without the teachers really thinking about uh, daily activities. As you recall, we thought we were gonna be back three weeks. So we're kind of like just like putzing around for the three weeks and all of a sudden it's now distance learning. So, um, you know, you need a lot of time to kind of really think about thoughtful virtual learning. Um, so it's going to look different. I want to show another screen. So to give you a little bit of context of what we're thinking about. Um, so here's just an example. Uh, so this is com coming out of some really quick, we've been in this space for about two weeks thinking about what type of models will come out. So what I want to show here at the very top of this is there probably will, I would imagine, be some type of still home learning option. So families who still are concerned about bringing kids back in and, you know, and then those families that say, man, we can't get back to work unless our kids are at school. And then there's that hybrid model in between, like, yeah, maybe we have some kids come two days a week and then some kids um, participate virtually. So no matter what, what we're looking at here is this, this kind of this yellow band here, no matter what plan you ultimately land into or where we land, this high collaboration um, space is gonna be critical. And that's the magic at Design 39. So every morning for the past six years, every, every staff member is in collaboration um, from 7.45 to 8.45. So that is part of our culture. And because of that, we're able to design really robust experiences for kids. So what's gonna happen though, no matter where we are, we're gonna like design those teachers. So say two teachers maybe are in charge of the virtual learning piece they'll still be in that collaborative space, but then they would break out. And I'm gonna say it's gonna be very, probably very different than what you've experienced with distance learning. Distance learning was really about trauma-informed instruction during a pandemic. So actual virtual learning is gonna to have to take on that actual piece that we can probably learn from with homeschool systems that we've learned from that. And so, but yeah, underneath that is ensuring that every student gets a high quality experience based off of that thoughtful planning that the teachers are doing no matter if they're in a home school or coming on campus or hybrid. So that just kind of needing to ensure that that happens for every student. So maybe there's a Monday, Tuesday thing that happened and teachers are in charge of that. And then, you know, maybe a, a Thursday, Friday, but some type of hybrid model I would imagine is gonna be a reality, especially starting in August, September. School will happen, you'll see it, it's happening in China, all kinds of, uh, sorry, not China, um, uh, South Korea already has kids back, seniors, they're doing it by the oldest kids. Some other nations are doing it by the youngest kids coming first. We're not sure yet exactly what that's gonna look like. But yes, yeah, so the first question, there'll be some type of hybrid model, I would imagine. Um, we're collecting a lot of data right now from the staff uh, through the district. What staff feels good about coming back? Who's um, immune compromised? How many staff would have to do some type of home learning with kids? How many parents are, are thinking about that? Because at the end of the day, if parents start pulling their kids all, I don't think Design 39 is gonna have that problem. We have, for instance, 70 kids on a wait list for kindergarten alone for next year. Um, we're at 1300 kids for next year. Um, so, but in other spaces where they're, it's slower to make that transition, you know, you start pulling kids, every kid that gets pulled out and put into another type, um, you know, home program that's outside of POSD costs the district $10,000. That's where you can ultimately have some type of collapse. Like if, if all of a sudden there is no kids that are in the system, there is no funding that continues to support that. So as we kind of 
build this thing together and understand that we are patient and give each other grace because we don't ultimately want that collapse of public education, right? So we've had six years of this thing, so many opportunities for us to go charter we never did because we believe public education is the greatest gift we can give kids. All right, so that's the blue one. Uh, next one is this green one. What are the possibilities of options for reopening back to normal school hours, hybrid structures? So you can see a lot of people thinking about these same things, continuing with distance learning would be a mandatory since some parents will be back to work, right? So that's why you can sense just going back and reading these, there's gonna be a need for probably a hybrid model. And that's why we're planning these different scenarios so that no matter what comes up, we can pivot and be really thoughtful with that instruction. That's why we, you'll see at the end of this, this um, conversation with you is that uh, getting that gift of time for teachers to do that planning because it's not built into the system currently because it's built off of a, a traditional system where you're at school and teachers get the plan, but that's not happening as robust because we're looking virtually. LEDs, uh, so thanks for thinking about them. How are the LEDs feeling about reopening in the fall? Do they feel that they can sustain the distance learning opportunities that they're currently providing? Understanding that they too have to balance home balance. Yeah, we have a lot of um, parents, teachers, right? Who have kids who they're trying to have learning at the same time and then teach other kids, you know, classmates, their homeroom at the same time. So that's why we would try to blend out like what, what makes the most sense for which teachers to be part of that process. Um, I can tell you straight out, uh, this is not what energizes them for the most part. Um, they're energized by being with kids. That's what they got into business for. So seeing the kids being able to pivot, pull a small group, put them at the table. Um, so yeah, they're energized by the people around them. And so uh, it's super tiring. Um, we're looking for opportunities to just reconnect as humanity. So um, I think just keeping, you know, a pulse check on our teachers has been really important. We're at the end of the year, so be really patient because um, energy, we're re redesigning classes for next year, thinking about like placement of our own teachers. So just a lot of, of change happening all at once. So that creates a lot of stress. So uh, just giving a lot of grace to people at this point in time is really helpful. Um, uh, next, purple. Uh, will parents have the option to have their children continue distance learning, uh, especially if you have high risk? Of course, we would, if there's immune compromise at home, um, you know, I don't know a lot about the transmission rates in terms of kids bringing that back and forth from home and school. Um, that's not for me to talk about, but probably talk about that next week uh, at seven o'clock on Thursday with Dr. Butler. But I do believe that's why it's so critical that um, for some, it makes sense to come back right away in August and some maybe it makes sense to come back in um, Thanksgiving break or in January uh, when other things are in place um, to create, you know, ultimately that vaccine or some, something else that's coming out that will make it great for, for everybody. Um, yellow, I don't know how parents that both work can do anything other than traditional school schedule. Yeah, I think uh, we're really gonna have to rethink Bridge. So our ESS before school, after school program, might we be able to use them in a way that's uh, uh, creative? There are two looking at opening prior. So a lot of eyes will be on that because they are um, essential workers in terms of getting people back to work uh, as part of daycare. Um, but how might we actually use them as a support system for learning and extension and before after school for parents who can't do that? So who have to be at a physical work location. Not everybody can do um, uh, work from home. So we need to be factoring that and thinking about that and kind of taking this data back to the district and the district planning team and building that out. So yeah, I think it's that's a, an important question. So that's the what questions are on your mind regarding reopening school in August, there's a lot more. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some time probably over this week and into the weekend, and then I'll just type a response under each one of these as best as I can without being too obnoxious and then see if there's any repeated patterns um, so that you can come back to this document and, and see what, what Joe was talking about. I'll put the video link on here as well as, as a column link so you can share that. All right, so we're gonna get into this, uh, just checking time, good. So about 12 more minutes we'll spend in the slides and then we'll open it up for folks. Uh, what do you need to feel good about returning your child to campus? The, these, per, these three rows of purple, so there's 14 here, eight and 11, just in this document saying, we don't want our kids wearing masks. Um, they're uncomfortable, they don't feel good on kids, they don't feel like they can't breathe right. It, so, so when kids are on campus, I think there's something here we need to figure out because it's around, you know, using proper hand sanitizing and making sure we're watching kids, you know, wash hands, um, maybe temperature checks twice a day, 
um, cleaning the rooms thoroughly. So lots of different things that have to do with just ensuring that kids can just come and be kids, I think is a critical feedback and feed forward piece that we want to pay attention to. A lot of like agreeing no mask. If there's too much process and restrictions, so 11 people here were like thumbing this thing up. If there is too much process and restrictions, we are inclined to homeschool moving forward as I'm sure many others were as well. So there's this, if there's too many constraints as well, that's a concern of parents that it just doesn't feel natural anymore. Um, and so how do we do that? Um, kind of reminds me taking us back to 9-11 when we had to kind of change and take off shoes. That's one thing, right? You take off shoes, you put them in a scanner, but when your entire day feels like that, I think we'll have to understand that, figure that out and ensure that the environment that we're operating in is safe. Daily cleaning, uh, this is the yellow one here, uh, of high touch points, critical. Uh, looking at um, uh, like different, like they have different bombing systems that you can like spray her out. And I, I don't know enough about that, but I'm sure there's our risk. What I do know is our risk management is looking into uh, different systems. I definitely know they're looking into um, temperature checking for each uh, classroom, things like that. So. Uh, POSD is looking at that's why there's a significant mm, budget impact on this because there's new resources and tools and cleaning supplies and things that we didn't typically need on a regular basis we needed soap and and toilet paper yep we need toilet paper um, and all those things that we have at, at site but you know I, that's why you're seeing these budget constraints come up because there's a lot of tools that we need to ensure the safety to get kids on campus if that's the parent choice uh, this pink one here, I do not feel safe returning in August. Many grandparents and caregivers uh, will be out at risk. Uh, why are we rushing to this? Everyone's uh, standards of hygiene are, hygiene are different. Uh, why can't distance learning continue? And I think that's the dichotomy we're seeing, right? Is um, that can we do a one size fits all? And I think at this point, it would be really, really tricky. So having a diverse opportunity for parents to feel good and to support you know, um, folks getting back to work and uh, supporting learning critically, but supporting the social emotional well-being of kids that we are recognizing as critical, supporting the social well-being of adults. So all those things are really important. That kind of gets into some of these questions on the right, what's needed right now. So there's other great questions down here and I'll, I'll try to answer those as best as well. So I'm not trying to ignore you, just looking at where the energy was from our community. Uh, last column here, uh, take the last few minutes. Uh, what information do you need right now? And I think this is really helpful for us. So as we're in May and closing out this year and thinking about into next year, what are the things that we should be thinking about? So in August, uh, we'll, it will still be distance learning because um, it's still not safe for our kids to be back. Can the kids remain the same LED and have that they have right now. So there's, there's two or three things, comments in here that had energy around this idea of looping. We've been doing that for uh, the beginning. Now, we're still navigating this, how best to do that, because we also have uh, new kids that are coming in, about 14, uh, because we're growing our enrollment uh, from 1150 to 1300. So how do you still have these small family groups and still allow kids to feel connected who are coming in new to the system? Um, so we're looking at that, we definitely know uh, there's going to be some type of looping, obviously, in the one twos still, um, the Ks, but I think it's a great feedback loop for us to kind of continue to think about best placement of kids. How do we do that work? I don't have any great answers for you other than the feedback is here and we appreciate it and we'll take it to heart. Uh, will there be distance learning options still available for families that do not feel comfortable? So similar to the other ones, just information they need right now. Um, I think the next one talks just about this, yeah, being in limbo. And when we don't have information, especially if us who are kind of need that structure to know how to be able to make a decision or like daycare or, you know, can I go return to work? What is it going to look like? So having our best version yet is going to be helpful. Um, you know, that it's not so moving on a dime that we can't be predictable. But I think um, shortly... Um, we need to be able to sh share with our parents collectively across Poway Unified what it's going to look like because this one here kind of captures that. Right now we're all in limbo. We realize there is so much of the school to figure out. It would be nice if you could give us uh, a date for when we will learn about the options as for the fall so we can make decisions for our families. For example, it'd be better to know like school announced the plans for the fall by July 1st. That, I think that's fantastic. That's what we would like. We're still at the, in a sense, mercy of 
the governor in terms of how they can release and the CDC and the guidelines that we have and uh, the county and what the county's trying to do and how they get a collective, what are their 48, uh, I think, districts within the San Diego County and how do they all kind of work together? You know, we have uh, San Diego Unified, 112 kids, 112,000 kids, and how do they navigate? But it's different than Poway. So there's a lot of um, moving parts. So that's why I want us as Design 39, like what is it that's critical for our families that we know that we can actually um, have some control over, that we can communicate with you all and learn that what is that that you need and and that timing so that we can be able to support you. So we're, we're showing some plans. I showed you some of those things that we've been thinking about ensuring high quality instruction across the board. Uh, do we expect school closures again in the fall and winter? Uh, I'm gonna hold on to that question and probably give that one to Dr. Butler for next week uh, so that he can maybe look at trends that he's noticing with his um, doctor team across the nation. Uh, will the kids still have access? Great, access to summer programs. So the district and S ST Math, I believe, Alexia, that's the reading program, and IXL, that's kind of the math language program, those are going to be offered through the summer. So two components to that, we have a lot of students, well, not a lot, sorry, we have about 10 to 15 percent of our students out of the 1150 that have a borrowed device. Those borrowed devices, we're going to allow those students to keep them through the summer. So I think that's going to be helpful for our families who want to continue learning. IXL and Lexia for sure will be offered through I know um, at least through June 20th, one of them, and through the end of the summer for the other. This is where the collaborative come, come in. We just had a conversation today with our own team that maybe there's a couple products that we wanna ensure that we can maybe pay for through the end of the summer or actually like um, allow them to move forward uh, into the next year because it's just such a high quality product. So probably look for some uh, information gathering around products that have really, really been helpful for you at home that then we can use that feedback to then actually buy the program so that our students can continue learning through the summer as well. So yes, they'll be available. Yes, we'll continue to allow the students to, who have the Bauer devices to keep them at home. We will be collecting the devices from our eighth grade students who have borrowed them, and we will be collecting the devices obviously from the kids who are moving on out of state or are moving to a different school. That number is pretty small, yet um, we wanna be able to collect our resources. But overall, we want people to continue the summer learning. Okay. Uh, so that's another question just about summer learning. Uh, the blue one here, my kid is thriving with the current fifth grade distance learning. My only concern was all the computer vision syndrome. So just that I feel it myself too. I'm on Zoom calls all day long like you all. Um, you know, I was looking at a, a, like trying to read like the back of a, a label the other day and like I, I couldn't even focus on it. It was just just crazy. So we, I think that's critical. We have to figure out as we move this thing forward, how do we get time away from the screen, out in the open, in the sunshine, um, if that's a choice to be like in distance learning space. Obviously, that's the thing that we would do when we're out of school. I mean, at school, because that's what we do is collaboration. It's not about the technology. It's about the collaboration and the design thinking uh, that we do. So yes and yes, agree, screen time, um, something that we all collectively need to do is get away from those. Uh, when is the last day of distance learning? All right, so this is probably a good place to kind of end here and I'll stop my screen. Yeah, so I can see y'all. Um, the, so what we're gonna do, so on Jan, I'm sorry, June 3rd, June 3rd, it's a Wednesday, it's going to be the drive-through promotion parade for eighth grade. So they can, so they cannot get out of the car. It's going to be some type of parade style. We can't have massive gatherings. So it just is um, essential workers there along with the kids and driving through the parade. So that's the 3rd of June. Thursday will be the last day of distance, formal distance learning. So that's the where there's office hours and there's requirements. After that, that's the Thursday, June the 4th. June the 5th, we're going to start. There's lots of materials. We thought we we're only going to be out for three weeks. So we're going to start now returning materials back to kids because there's stuff in their cubbies and things like that. So we'll be coordinating times starting on the Friday and then Monday, I think that's the 8th, 9th, and 10th. So that Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So during those times is coordinating, returning books, loft books, materials, um, technology, uh, giving things back to kids. So we'll probably be using the loop uh, the front drive through so we can just um, hand things in bags and whatnot to you. Um, we'll be coordinating it by homeroom. So we're collecting data on how much stuff is in the classroom from the teachers and how much needs to go back to the kids. So that just takes time with navigating 
1,100 kids. We do it in 15 minutes every morning, but you know, to get stuff back to kids, I think it's going to take a little bit of time. So we're navigating that. Then we're using that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for, uh, and part of Friday before to start really navigating and digging into this, what, was, what will next year look like? And more importantly, what are the critical components of high quality instruction, no matter what domain a parent chooses? So that's what a lot of that time that we need because the last contracted day for the teachers is on Friday, June 12th. So we're looking at using that week. So there'll still be um, optional learning experiences for you to do. There'll still be things for your kids to connect with. Um, there'll still be the online resources, but we just need that time so that when we launch, we're not like, because when they come back, the teachers get two days for prep um, when we return for school next year. So that's clearly not gonna be enough. So we wanna use a lot of the time here that we have access to them as they've learned and it's fresh in their head, like what is distance learning? What are some of the sweet spots? What are the pain points so that we can really navigate through that? Uh, for instance, like four or five is taking their basically the entirety of the day tomorrow just to unpack some of the things because they're growing from eight LEDs to nine. So now they have to figure out how do we navigate nine LEDs in that space. K3 has been working for probably a week, two weeks now straight, just figuring out what does that look like and what configuration and how do we make that happen that's effective. So it's just been a lot of energy on top of distance learning to ensure that our kids have a great experience coming up. So, so just kind of giving you the why to that. And so um, if there's some pushback on that, happy to hear it, um, but just to give you the context. Okay, look at that, 729 Sai, pretty darn good. So we got 30 minutes. Um, there's 100 people on this call, so that means some people didn't get to make it in. So, uh, Sai, maybe we could capture some of the, these notes and we could put it in maybe to the Padlet as we're hearing it. I'm going to stop recording now.